So I'm going to talk today about imagining the future, and I'm going to do it with a contrarian bent and share the framework that we as venture capitalists look through when we make investments. And the framework is pretty simple. It's basically going to start with where to focus. And when we look at where to focus, I'm going to invoke some special ghosts. Then we're going to look at how to predict. And when we look at how to predict, I'm going to invoke some science fiction. And then I'm going to talk about how to get edge. And how to get edge, the hint here is it's all about time. In New York, our office is just near the New York Public Library. And there's a whole set of placards between our office and the library. And my favorite is this one. It says that the reading of good books is like a conversation with the best men of past centuries. So I'm going to open this book, and I'm going to invoke some of these ghosts tonight. And in particular, it's F. Scott Fitzgerald and Mark Twain and Arthur Schopenhauer. And each one of these folks has a famous literary quote that's affiliated with them that I think can tell us where to look and where not to look, where to spend your time and where to ignore. And let's start with F. Scott Fitzgerald. His famous quote was that the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And so you can think about this as almost everything that you read on the front page of newspapers. And you can think about something like gold. Some people say it's nothing but a shiny piece of metal. Other people say it's a great store of value in an otherwise fiat currency world. You can look at something like China. It's a great engine of growth, or it's a bubble waiting to be popped. And people say there's lies, damn lies, government statistics, and Chinese government statistics. The one certainty is the uncertainty, is the volatility between the two sides, as you have equally cogent arguments on both sides that fight it out. And so you can be long volatility, but you don't know necessarily what's going to happen. Our view is you shouldn't spend a lot of time on front page headline news. So where else do you look? Well, the second thing comes from Twain. And Twain's famous quote was, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Well, what are some examples of this? Most recently, housing crisis a few years ago, we assumed that housing prices continued linearly until they didn't. And we know what happened. Let's use a more colloquial example. Now, this one's technical, so bear with me. It's called the Turkey Growth Index. Turkey is born. Every day it grows, gets more food, gets fatter. Every day is better than the last until it ain't. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. So we live in the world of Arthur Schopenhauer. And his famous quote was that talent is hitting a target that nobody else can hit. But genius is hitting a target that nobody else can see. So let's look at some professional talent. I happen to love basketball. Here's Dwayne Wade. Now let's look at some amateur talent. That is, by the way, how our entrepreneurs feel when their companies go public. <laughs> but remember, that is talent, which is hitting a target that nobody else can hit, and genius hitting a target that nobody else can see, which means you have to look into the future. So how do you think about the future? How do you predict the future? Well, one of the great ways is to look into science fiction. Now, it turns out, I want to start with a philosophical truth here, and everybody at our firm knows this, that 100% of the information that we have right now, this is true of everybody at this point in time, is based on the past. And 100% of the value of that information and the decisions that you're going to make is based on the future, which is inherently probabilistic. It's not knowable. Lots more things can happen than will. And of course, there is a best way to predict the future, and that is to invent it. So 80, 90 years ago, these were the folks that were inventing the future. And when you fast forward a few decades, You'd see that these men who were the 1929 Bell Labs, mostly white men in pretty conservative coats, suddenly you fast forward to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and now we've got some women in the room and still in our conservative lab coats. And then you've got these miscreants. <laughs> You'll recognize them as the founding team of Microsoft. We've had the great pleasure of now co-investing with Bill Gates and with Paul Allen and a variety of companies and some entrepreneurs, including these. And these entrepreneurs are the folks that are inventing the future. And to a man or to a woman, if you ask them, what was it that inspired you? They will all say it was science fiction. And this is quite interesting, because either our scientists are becoming way more creative, 
or our science fiction authors are becoming way less creative. But the gap between science fiction and science fact is closing. And I'm going to give you some examples. Think about Captain Kirk in Star Trek. He had his tricorder. And then, of course, you got your Motorola StarTac. Good inspiration. We got the phaser and then the taser. Now, importantly, Steve Jobs is hailed as a genius, and it's hard to disagree. But I also think he was an amazing sci-fi archivist. This was Captain Picard, Star Trek Next Generation. You can see scattered on his desk the precursor to the iPad. Well, what about 2001 Space Odyssey, video conferencing? Looks remarkably like Steve revealing FaceTime. You've got Hal, and you've got Siri, and then you've got Google doing the same thing. Terminator, optical lenses that could scout out the world. And on the bottom, you should hear some sound here for Google and Google Glass. OK, Glass, record a video. Now, it isn't just robots from Terminator and Google. It's also headline news. So whether it is looking at robots replacing jobs or Chinese workers in Taiwan, Foxconn itself is taking a million workers and planning to replace them with robots. It's pretty significant. Was that ever ordained? Well, in fact, it was in the 1950s, 1960s, Lucille Ball. Now, listen very carefully to what she says here. Now I think we're fighting a losing game. Well, let's look at what that game looks like today. This is Adept Technologies. But of course, it isn't limited to just robotics. You can look at biotech. On the top, we've got Fantastic Voyage, taking nanobots and going into the blood cells and targeting disease. On the bottom is an MIT spin-out, a company of ours that's actually gone public, which is targeting cancer at the earliest stages. Same premise. You've got robotic surgery, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. And on the bottom, intuitive surgical, using surgical robots to do things like prostatectomies with their Da Vinci. We've actually backed the founder in a new company, not yet revealed, and we couldn't be more excited about that. The prequel to Aliens, you've got this orb that will go through this cavernous region just like this using something equivalent to LIDAR, basically using laser range finding. And on the bottom, which is not science fiction, are drones, like one of our companies, Sci-Fi, that is able to navigate through a room and let you know the height and width and depth as it navigates in unknown terrain. Michael D uh, Douglas in the movie Disclosure, he's going to be laser scanned and don virtual reality goggles and then enter an immersive world. And many people might be familiar today. On the top, Oculus Rift, donning virtual reality goggles, much the same. And on the bottom, one of our companies, Matterport, this is our New York City office that was digitally scanned. And you can see the mesh and the mosaic. It's almost like entering the matrix. Of course, we're all familiar with Star Trek and the replicator, the ability to conjure your morning coffee. And then you've got the MakerBot replicator and 3D printing and form labs on the bottom where you can conjure objects at will. And we've got a company, Shapeways, which can let you print anything that you can imagine, including a coffee cup a day, limited only in the designs of your imagination, which is pretty cool. And there's an interesting parallel here that you can draw from the past when you think about the translation between atoms and bits. You wanted to send a letter to somebody, you would write it in physical form and send it to somebody, and they would get it. Well, when we invented the fax machine, you could take those atoms and convert them into digital bits and then transmit those digital bits. They would be reconstructed on the other side and come out again as atoms. And then we went straight bits to bits in the form of email and internet. Think about manufacturing in the same lens. You design something, you mass manufacture it, Pony Express, you get it a few weeks later, you get your wrench. Now, CAD and CAM design come along, let you design in silico inside the computer. You're still printing it out at a large manufacturing plant. Now you get it overnight at FedEx, and then you get your wrench. And then we go direct from bits to atoms using 3D printing. And that's why all of our things that come out of Shapeways don't say made in China or made in USA. They say made in the future. And that's because the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. 
and you think about the people that are inventing that future and the path that it takes, it doesn't matter the volatility in public markets. It doesn't matter political events. Remember, ignore those headlines. Most people presume linearity. And of course, all this happens exponentially. And that is a really powerful curve to follow. You know it from Moore's Law, but you also know it from storage and telephony and displays and cameras. And then it starts to get amazing because your DSLR camera of a few years ago has all the components and capabilities and complexity today of a small component inside of last year's iPhone 5S. And then you can go to an entire different industry and just ride that curve. And this is what we did to help predict the future in energy. There was a big wave around alternative energy and a lot of people investing in solar and wind and biofuels and ethanol and batteries and electric cars and we shunned it because of this curve. Mankind's march of energy went from carbohydrates to hydrocarbons to uranium towards nuclear. And the undeniable trend was more and more energy density per unit of raw material. And so we reasoned that to go backwards in time to an agrarian economy was foolhardy and we got excited about nuclear. Now where were we going to invest? We started with what the biggest problem was, which was what do you do with the waste? And there's defense waste and there's commercial waste. And we looked around for a company and we couldn't find one, so we started one from scratch. We named it after Madame Curie who discovered radiation and we called it Curion, spelled with a K. And we got the best people we could find, the best technologies we could find, and they intelligently positioned it that no matter what would happen in nuclear, they'd win. If there was a renaissance, there'd be more waste, they'd win. If, instead, status quo continued, nothing changed, plants get older, produce more waste, they'd win. And if there was a catastrophe, unfortunately, they'd also win. March 11th, 2011, Fukushima. Earthquake strikes Japan, tsunami takes out the reactor, and this created a lot of international havoc. Our team responded with their technologies. They started out with just a few people on the ground. This is never before seen footage of them actually arriving at the Fukushima plant. You can see the degree of the destruction. It's almost like a meteor comet hit the plant. And then in the ensuing weeks, they assembled the technologies, the teams on the ground in Japan and in the US, supply chains, and the technology that they deployed was material science and chemistry and physics and engineering to be able to pull out 99% of the radiation from that disaster after tens of millions of gallons of radioactive water were there. And they risked their life and limb to do this and created an amazing business out of something that started out as an idea in our New York office. And that amazing and enthralling and hard thing that they did is where we focus our attention. On that top right quadrant, because the vast majority of people are focused on easy things and trivial things, and you get thousands and thousands of competitors in that quadrant of easy and trivial. Easy and trivial is incremental. It is short-term focused. And hard and amazing and enthralling is long-term focused, and that takes a certain kind of fortitude. And so when we look at the things that we're investing in now that we think are amazing and enthralling and hard, there are some eclectic areas, like space and near-space imaging and metamaterials and new frontier of physics and computational photography and tattoo technology for application and removal. I always joke that most people that have tattoos end up long regret and they want to reverse that decision. Digital autopsy and pathology. These are interesting areas and we often feel lonely in them because there aren't a lot of investors. And that serves us well because it's an edge. So now I want to talk about edge and how you actually get an edge in scouting out these areas and investing in them. Now, there's three main sources. You can get an informational edge, you can get an analytical edge, or you can have a behavioral edge. So you start with the first, informational. It's really hard today. Information is at the speed of light. There's regulatory regimes. It's very hard that I can get better information than you. What about analytical? We both get the same piece of information, but I analyze it differently, maybe better than you. I put different weights on the information, different time frames. That's also really hard because it presumes that you might be smarter than somebody else and there's a lot of smart people out there. So that leaves one last thing, which is behavioral. And this is the hardest and it's the most enduring because it is very easy to think differently, it's very hard to act differently. For most of our evolutionary past, sticking with the herd ensured our survival. The people that ran off from the herd got eaten. And so this is probably best embodied in a famous experiment it's called the Ash Experiment, about how easy it is to conform and about how hard it is to resist the temptation to conform. The four people that are seated next to the guy in the red sweater are actors, and they're all going to lie. And he's going to be asked which of a series of lines matches another. And let's watch what happens. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 <laughs> Two. 
two. He can't believe these One. people. He knows Once what the again, right answer the is. Answer is two. Three. 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 That's it. Two times, and he conformed. He gave up his analytical, he gave up his informational, and he succumbed to the behavioral edge, and many people do. Well, it turns out if you take those lines and you tilt them horizontally, this is where we think the one lasting source of edge is for entrepreneurs, for investors, and everybody in our everyday wake of life. It's time. If the market is discounting back 12 or 18 months, somebody that is thinking out two years or three years or five or 10 has an advantage. We call it time arbitrage. And it turns out that the disposition for this starts really young. Many people are familiar with the Michel marshmallow test. A bunch of kids are put in a room and marshmallows put in front of them, and they're told that if they can wait, they'll get another or maybe more. But it's amazing the spectrum of responses that you get. Some people touch it, they lick it, they pick at it. They smell it. I can't wait. This guy's going to be a day trader. But she does something very interesting. I think she's going to be a great venture capitalist. She knows that she can't resist the temptation, so she pushes it out of her field of sight. That's a very astute behavior. This is what Odysseus did when he tied himself to the mast to resist the siren song, to tie ourselves to the mast. Now, technology can play a role in how we think about time because technology helps us hack all sorts of things. Technology hacks time, just like it hacks distances. It can take people that are very far away and bring them very close. Unfortunately, as we all know in our daily lives, it also takes people that are very close and makes us feel very far away. <laughs> technology can let us see out into our celestial heavens and down into our microbial world. We can take things that are too fast for the eye to see, like a photo finish, and capture that. And we can see things that take too long for us to watch and see entire buildings get built over the course of years in mere seconds. And we can watch lifetimes go before our eyes. And it turns out that time and life are the most important resources that we have. And we ought to allocate them wisely, the same way we do our money. And we ought to allocate them into things that matter into amazing and hard and really non-trivial things. And it turns out that we have a framework for this. We can look to the past, and it can guide us about where we should focus, get some wisdom. We can look to imagine futures and use that to help guide us about where we ought to invest and invent. And then we can look to ourselves and try to steal ourselves and to step out from the crowd and to think a little bit bigger and to look a little bit longer, and then to venture out a little bit further. Thank you.